Hello, my name is Max Harrison. I am a local Grambling historian, and today I am going to be talking a little bit about the history of the Grambling School District's oldest building, uh, the Perry Center, which just turned 100 years old in January of 2022. Uh, so this presentation is going to go into the background of why this building was built, um, its evolution and growth as the community grew with it, and some of its more recent history. Um, so let's get started. Uh, one thing that is very important to know about uh, Grand Blanc is that before about the middle part of the 20th century, before um, the 1960s or so, Grand Blanc was predominantly an agricultural community. Uh, this picture here shows a uh, farming operation on a farm on Perry Road right around the turn of the century. Um, and it was very similar to operations going on at the many hundreds of farms that were across Grand Blanc and the rest of Genesee County. Uh, Grand Blanc was predominantly agricultural. Uh, the businesses here predominantly served uh, the interests of agriculture and the majority of people going to school in Grand Blanc. Uh, were young children growing up on farms. Most of those children went to schools that looked very similar to this. This was the Halsey School, which was located at Baldwin and Halsey Road, right about where the Grand Blanc Fire Station is now. Uh, this school was very typical of the one-room schoolhouses, the rural schools that were predominant across the American Midwest before uh, World War II. These schools, um, we tend to think of them kind of in idyllic terms. We romanticize the one-room schoolhouse, but there were a lot of problems with these schools. Uh, and reformers at the turn of the 20th century really uh, identified, tried to identify a lot of those problems and correct them uh, with the aim of giving uh, young boys and girls on the farm um, a better deal um, in education, uh, similar to what their counterparts in cities were getting. So some of the problems that they identified were that these buildings were small. Um, the Halsey School was only uh, 22 by 30 feet, if I remember correctly. Um, dimly lit, you can see that the windows are pretty small. Um, they did not have indoor plumbing, rarely had electricity. Uh, to go out, use the restroom, you had to go outside to an outhouse to get water. You had to use a pump, like you can see down in the lower left-hand corner of this picture. Uh, all around, uh, life was pretty hard for people going to school in these. Um, there wasn't even heating systems. Um, usually you had the, the kind of the classic wood stove, which rarely kept the building hot or alternatively got way too hot and nobody could be near it. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the curriculum was usually not that good. Uh, young kids were often being educated by teachers who had little more than an eighth grade education themselves. Uh, I've heard many instances of kids, some of the older kids in a one-room school actually being older than the teacher. That was not common, um, not all that uncommon. So basically by the early 20th century, education reformers were identifying these problems and they were trying to come up with solutions to them. They were arguing that the one-room school had had its day and that it was time to replace it with something new. And what they identified was something called school consolidation. And school consolidation was the idea of merging one-room schools into larger school districts that would take up um, larger units of land. They could pool their resources, um, offer better programs, that sort of thing. And the first school to do that in Michigan's Lower Peninsula was right here in Grand Blanc, and it was in this school that you see here. This school was built on the site of the Perry Center in 1894. It replaced a two-room building that had been built on the site in 1867. This building was also a two-room building. Um, it was much larger and much nicer than many of the one-room schools that were spread throughout Grand Blanc Township. And in 1903, the Cook School, which was on Cook Road at Embury Road, merged with this school through a new law that the state had passed allowing schools to consolidate. The following year, in 1904, the district annexed the Porter School that was on Porter Road. Students were brought to school. Um, if you lived outside of the village of Grand Blanc, you were brought to school in a horse-drawn bus. There were two of them, and you can see one of them in uh, the forefront of this picture right here. Uh, <clears throat> this was a very revolutionary thing at the time. It allowed um, 
Grand Blank kids to get a better education than they were getting in the one room school. Uh, so they were having, they had access to busings. They didn't have to walk to school. They had access through the 10th grade um, when the one room schools usually only went through eighth grade. Uh, to accommodate the increasing enrollment from bringing in consolidated one room schools, they constructed an addition off the back, uh, making the building eventually five rooms total. By uh, 1920, practically every school district in Genesee, or excuse me, in Grand Blanc Township had consolidated with the Grand Blanc Village School. And community members were clamoring for the opportunity to build a real high school that could offer through the 12th grade. Uh, if you wanted to go on through high school, uh, to high school, if you wanted to go through the 12th grade after you finished the 10th grade, um, if you were a young kid in Grand Blanc, your option was basically to go to Flint Central High School or maybe to high school in Fenton. Those were the closest 12th grade high schools. There was a lot of debate in the community about how to um, address this. Some people didn't want to fund um, a whole new building. Some people wanted to add on to this structure. No one could really make up their minds. Um, and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, fate intervened. On December 9th, 1920, a uh, fire started in the home economics classroom when uh, grease spilled on a kerosene range stove and started a fire that destroyed the building. 200 kids were attending classes in there and According to one newspaper article that reported that there was perfect operation of the fire drill that morning, uh, nobody was injured in the fire. Unfortunately, though, the building was destroyed. Uh, community members uh, settled their quarrels about building a new building pretty quickly after that, and in March of 1921, approved a bond for $107,000 to construct what was called the Grand Blank Township Unit School, the oldest part of our current day Perry Center. This building was 15 rooms on three floors and included the district's first gymnasium. Construction started in March of 21 and the building was completed and officially opened to students on January 9th, 1922. The building was hailed as among the most modern school buildings in the state of Michigan at the time. It had all of the modern conveniences that education reformers had clamored for, uh, for better opportunities for kids than you could get in a one-room schoolhouse. It had indoor plumbing. It had a very, very modern uh, ventilation heating system that changed the air in the rooms very uh, often. It included a gymnasium. It included a classroom for each of the first sixth grades. And crucially, it included space for a full high school through the 12th grade. Children were brought to school in motorized buses that were converted from Ford Model Ts. Uh, here are two of the first, er, er, the first buses here, uh, shown on a country road in Grand Blanc Township. In 1922, three students returned from Flint Central and became the first graduating class from Grand Blanc High School. Uh, from left to right, they are Ethel Tyler, Ernest Summers, and Bernita Taylor. The three of them had attended school in Grand Blanc. They had grown up here, but because they did not have the option to go on locally, they went elsewhere. They went to Flint. <clears throat> uh, the first superintendent of the t at the time, Glenn Wakefield, wrote them all letters encouraging them to come back, uh, telling them that uh, Grand Blanc was going to establish a full high school. And they responded and they came back and they became our first graduating class. There were originally three students in that first graduating class, but that didn't last long. Enrollment started to grow rapidly. Uh, in 1924, uh, the district realized that they really should have made the building bigger when they had built it. Uh, in fact, the community had debated including space above the gymnasium uh, for extra room for the junior high school grades, but they had voted that down as unnecessary at the time. By 1924, the building was so overcrowded that the district realized they would lose their accreditation from the University of Michigan if they did not construct an addition. And so that year, voters approved a bond to construct a three-room addition that added a third floor over the gym. Uh, at the same time, it also added a stage and changing rooms to the west end of that gymnasium. So you can see here, the building is beginning to kind of take on its shape that we are more familiar with today. In 1926, construction started on the second major addition to the building on the south end. This 
added six, excuse me, seven classrooms, and uh, it kind of wrapped the building around, started moving it to the west, and at the same time, it added the second main entrance that we are familiar with today. I want to reiterate really quickly that Grand Blanc was a rural community at the time, and its children were very much engaged in agriculture. In the 1920s and the 1930s, students had the option to take classes in agriculture and other agriculture adjacent topics. At the same time, they could produce it or participate in clubs like 4-H and Future Farmers of America. Shown here are three photographs from the collection of Joseph Jewett, uh, Graham Blank's uh, specially trained agriculture teacher uh, that are in the records of the Grand Blank Heritage Association. Um, these pictures are from the 1940s, but they give you an idea of some of the activities that young kids at Grand Blank were actually engaged with. Um, things like uh, running tractors on local farms, raising chickens, uh, actually learning how to um, operate and manage farms and create their own little projects out of that. At the same time though, Grand Blank was very much an academically focused school. Um, this is in the study hall that was on the third floor of the Perry Center. Uh, Grand Blanc became a place where you could go and expect to go on to college afterwards. Um, it was considered one of the finest high schools in Genesee County. <clears throat> and really, they made good on the opportunities um, that they were providing to young kids to actually, you know, go on and do something with their lives if they didn't want to uh, stay local, stay on the farm. They had options um, that really no young rural kids in, Gen um, in Grand Blanc or much of rural Genesee County had options to. The number of kids going to school at Grand Blanc continued to skyrocket. And by the 1940s, it was clear that there would have to be more additions. Uh, before I get ahead of myself with this photograph, uh, in 1937, construction began on a three-room, two-story separate building just to the south of the main school building. Uh, this is the section of the Perry Center that has the cafeteria on the second floor. Um, and when the building was built, initially, it wasn't intended for the cafeteria. It had the cafeteria on a small stage on the second floor, and on the ground level, there was a shop classroom, and there was a music room for the newly formed band. That uh, addition was completed in 1938. In 1942, anticipating the United States entry into the Second World War, the United States government purchased a large farm just north of the city of Grand Blanc and constructed a large manufacturing plant that the Fisher Body Company would use to manufacture tanks. This uh, was set to bring a large number of workers to the community who would be bringing with them their young children. School officials um, kind of rightfully panicked knowing that they did not have a enough, enough space in the school building to accommodate them. And so in 1942, construction started on what was supposed to be a temporary eight room addition using funds provided by the New Deal era Works Progress Administration. However, uh, and as the United States entered the war, uh, the WPA recalled uh, its contribution, stating that they needed the steel for the war effort. Uh, it took uh, Superintendent A.J. Brendel traveling out to the WPA offices in Chicago to plead his case for them to relent, and the WPA allowed for uh, basically half the materials um, that they had originally asked for. So the school district was able to complete a four-room temporary edition that they named the Annex. I have heard stories that this edition, uh, which obviously no longer exists, was so temporary that on windy days you could literally hear the walls shake. Um, and this picture shows the Annex under construction. As World War II came to a close, uh, the school district implemented its uh, a, a plan that they had been drafting since the middle years of the war, anticipating the large growths in enrollment that continued to take place. They called it the post-war building program. Um, and so here you can see a view of the, the school building looking kind of northeast, um, and it shows many of the additions that were added on um, in the post-war period. Uh, 
The first one was to the western end of the cafeteria building. In 1946, uh, the school district added six classrooms on the west end of that. Um, this is the area that is today part of the Board of Education meeting areas and the Vicki Weiss Innovation Lab on the upper floor. In 1949, the district tore down the annex and replaced it with an eight room, three story proper permanent addition that you can see kind of in the center of this photograph. Uh, this addition included a new entrance to the building facing the north. It is the part of the, um, it's the entrance where we typically enter the building today. Also included in this addition was a covered walkway, a permanent covered walkway between um, the cafeteria building and the main building. Uh, in 1950, anticipating um, the fact that the original boiler system from 1921 was overtaxed by all of these additions, uh, they expanded the boiler room out into the little courtyard formed by the building, and they constructed a large smokestack, that smoke, uh, the smokestack that stood until um, the summer of 2021. Finally, in 1951, construction started on the final major addition to the building. Uh, this was a six classroom addition on the west end that included a large new gymnasium. Uh, here you can see that addition under construction. And then um, here is the gymnasium upon its completion. Uh, that addition opened in 19, uh, 1952, excuse me. Uh, and when it did, it was one of the points, a major point of pride for the district. It was uh, considered one of the finest high school gymnasiums in the state for that time. Um, it allowed the district to host uh, high school playoff competitions and things of that nature. But still, even with all of these additions, the district knew, perhaps rightfully knew by that point, that they could not expand the original building forever, and that at some point soon they would need to start constructing new buildings. In 1954, this became a reality. Uh, as the district broke ground on its first independent standalone school building in over 30 years. Uh, shown here is the Grand Blank Board of Education, along with the architects and general contractors for um, the, this new school building. Turning the shovel over is Board of Education President Paul McGrath. On the far left is Anthony J. Brendel, A.J. Brendel, um, and next to him is Howard Pepper, who was the principal of Grand Blank High School for 30 years. Uh, as um, this building was constructed, the school board named the building for Paul McGrath in recognition of his many contributions to the community, um, including serving on the school board for many decades. The Paul the Paul McGrath School, shown in the top of this photograph, opened in 1955. In 1956, construction began on a second building, elementary building, shown in the bottom left here, uh, on a plot of farmland donated by the Myers family. Uh, Faye Morris and Kenneth Myers, all different generations of the Myers family, had served on the Grand Blank Board of Education at one time or another since the 1920s. And in recognition both of their donation of the land and of their long service to the school district, the school board named the building Myers Elementary School. Finally, in 1959, the district began construction on an elementary school just to the west of the main school building up the hill um, on the other side of the football field. And this building opened in January of 1960 and was named for uh, the longtime superintendent of the Grand Blank School District. Uh, Anthony J. Brendel, A.J. Brendel. At this point uh, in January of 1960, the remaining elementary kids at the school, uh, the main building, came back from their winter break. They gathered up their books from their classrooms and other supplies, and they literally carried them up the hill and started class in Brendel. This marked the end of elementary uh, education at uh, the Grand Blank Township Unit School for some time. Uh, the next to go was the high school. In 1962, construction started on a multi-million dollar massive high school facility in the uh, former farm just to the south of the original building. This was construct uh, completed construction in 1963, um, and the building was dedicated to Howard Pepper, the longtime principal of Grand Blank High School. That moved the uh, that moved the high school out of the building. This left just the junior high facility. 
Uh, for a couple of years, the building was just called Grand Blank Junior High School until 1967, when the continuously growing enrollment necessitated converting McGrath into a second junior high school. In recognition of uh, a longtime school board member um, and Flint banker named Ezra Perry, uh, the district renamed the original school building after him in 1967. Uh, to conclude very briefly, uh, some more recent history on the building. Uh, the building was Perry Junior High School until 1983. Throughout the 1970s, there were continuous calls to phase the building out. It was kind of recognized that it had had its day. It wasn't really seen, ironically, as a modern school building anymore, even though it had very much been one when it was built. And um, there were various ideas floated at different times about demolishing parts of the building, converting parts of the building into district administration facilities. Um, not much of that came to fruition, obviously. Uh, the closest anything really came to happening was in the late 1970s when the district actually voted on closing the facility um, in 1979, uh, but pushed back due to the fact only that they had no other junior high facility in which to relocate those students um, postponed that. Uh, in 1983, with declining enrollment in the district, the building was closed and the middle school facilities were consolidated into the West Campus building, which became Grand Blank Middle School. More recently, um, in the 1990s, uh, parts of the building which had been mothballed were reopened for overflow high school facilities. Um, they used the gymnasium for freshman and JV sports. Um, they used the old shop room as a uh, the district's print shop, which it still is today. And then in the mid 1990s, um, a teacher named Vicki Weiss and a handful of other teachers began um, what, what came to be known as City School, a, a small magnet elementary school program uh, in part of the building, which really helped reopen it um, and uh, get it kind of to what we know of it as today. So uh, this has been a brief, um, just a brief overview of the history of this building. There's obviously quite a bit more um, in depth that we can go with this. Um, and I invite you to um, visit the Grand Blanc Heritage Museum uh, if you are interested in learning more about this building. Um, and thank you much, very much for listening.